Um, I can't tell you how many times I've stood on this stage as a, uh, a professor in a, a course that I taught here for uh, some 38 years called Parasitic Diseases. So some of you may be expecting me to talk about what I've been involved with recently, which is urban agriculture. But really what I'd like to talk about is a continuation of the theme that you've already heard. <clears throat> how can we take results that we know are viable, good data and apply them to clinical situations to make a difference. So let me show you what I used to work on. And first, let me just say the title of the talk, The Best of Enemies, uh, I stole that from a film <clears throat> which was about World War II and starring David Niven uh, and a very uh, a famous Italian actor that has a single name of Sordi. And I highly recommend it. Netflix, it's a great evening of uh, entertainment. But we've come to realize that our own non-friendly parasitome or microbiome or virome, these are not altogether bad things. You have to look to the long term to figure out what they really mean. And so I'd like to tell you a story today about <clears throat> how I learned to stop worrying and to love my parasitome. So the worm that I worked on for 28 years in the lab with continuous funding from the National Institute of Health is called Trichinella spiralis. Now you think there's no connection between the last talk and this one, but it's not true because the word trichinella means little tiny hair. <laughs> so this worm was originally described in 1835 by these two gentlemen. Some of you may know either one of them. You certainly know Paget from Paget's disease because he went on to become a famous pathologist. The other was the director of the British Museum of Natural History, opposed Darwinism, and coined the term dinosaur. At the same time, on the same day, these two people using separate microscopes discovered this parasite. And ever since we've been fascinated with it, at least I have. And so you can see here uh, the life cycle of the parasite, well, some of the life cycle. In all mammals, which this parasite can infect, it's not a cycle. It ends up as a dead end in the muscle tissue. And the parasite now depends on that one host to live a long life and prosper, and then to move on <clears throat> and die so that it can be consumed far away from the original site of the infection. And in order to do so, it has developed a long-term survival strategy, namely this organ right here. For those of you that follow the, com the popular press, this photograph won the Small World Contest for Nikon in uh, 1976. <clears throat> I didn't take the picture, but I supplied the material. This parasite lives in this house. It builds itself a house. Well, how does it do that? And what is that house? Well, nobody knew when they looked in 1835, they thought this was a little worm coiled up in something. When they did the histology later on when the, the stains were developed for tissues, they saw that indeed it is muscle tissue, but it looks degenerate. So maybe this parasite lives off the degenerated tissue that it causes after it starts to grow. But let me tell you, <clears throat> if you're a human being and you catch this infection, you can harbor this thing for 30 years. That's a slow munch for a worm to continue to feed off of a little bit of tissue. So something else must be going on. So the moment I got a look at this organism under the electron microscope, things started to clarify. And this is called innovation. So the innovation is technological, right? So here's the worm in situ over here, and here's the way the muscle tissue looks over here. And it doesn't take an expert to figure out that's not muscle tissue. What the heck is it? That's exactly what I said. What is it? So we begin to realize that this is its home, whatever it is. It maintains it for long periods of time. So I started to call it the nurse cell. I know there are other nurse cells in the body, so that actually should be a capital N. I meant to distinguish it from the other nurse cells. So to, to find out, I had to innovate, because that's, again, the title of this presentation, right? Innovation. 
The infection ordinarily occurs in the gut tract with adults giving birth to these little larvae over here, one at a time, just like guppies give birth, one at a time, live guppies, live trichinella. And they find their way through the tissue into the blood, finally penetrating a single muscle cell, and that's where they set up their house, and 20 days later, they're infectious. But they do it one at a time, so if you use a natural infection, every single one of these nerve cells is a different age. So how could I establish this infection so that they're all the same age? How can I synchronize the infection so that I can work with it and understand the nuance of its life? And so I worked out a technology, very simple, just collect the adults when they're pregnant, put them in vitro, allow them to shed their worms overnight, get rid of the adults, keep the larvae. Now concentrate them by slow centrifugation, don't hurt them, and then inject them into the thigh muscle of a mouse. <coughs> and if you do that, all of the nurse cells develop at the same time. Voila, synchronous infection. So now, not only can I tell what's going on in the muscle tissue, I can see what's going on in the worm at the same time. So here's the growth curve of the worm, and here's the way it starts in the muscle, and here's the way it finishes 20 days later. So there's a molecular biology here someplace, right? <coughs> That's what I thought too. So what I found out was that this worm, in order to survive, actually elicits a circulation. It elicits a, a circulation, one that wasn't there before. And angiogenesis is a big deal. We've heard about cancer, lots of cancers. Many of the solid tumors elicit circulation. We know what angiogenesis is. And tumor cells and tumors elicit angiogenesis through a compound called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. And this VEGF elicits the capillaries to form towards the gradient of VEGF until finally they meet up, say you were cut, the way the wound healing occurs is VEGF on both sides starts to elicit these capillaries until they finally fuse. And at the same time, feedback mechanisms to the nucleus says, don't make any more VEGF, we've got the capillary. Judah Volkman at Harvard took advantage of this, took the little pieces of collagen type 4 that was created by the eating of the way through the tissue and isolated those little fragments and those are anti-angiogenic factors. So that's a potential cure for solid tumors, right? But this worm doesn't elicit sinus uh, capillaries. It elicits another vessel type, which we're not as familiar with, called sinusoids. What the heck is a sinusoid? First year medical students, raise your hands. <laughs> do you know what a sinusoid is? Second year medical students, do you know what a sinusoid is? You could go down the list, maybe even you know, vascular endothelial uh, uh, biologists don't know what a sinusoids are, but it's the organ that surrounds all of your endocrine glands. It allows easy access to the blood of hormones that are secreted by your endocrine system. They're leaky vessels, and this worm elicits them quite unusual. In fact, so unusual that no one had a model for sinusoid formation. And here's the way it looks. Here's the nurse cell circulatory ready, or sinusoids, and here's the way normal muscle circulation looks. And we did these studies by using anatomic plastic casts of their circulation. So, so what? I'll tell you so what. We then could do some molecular biology. And so what we set out to do was to show the timing of the elicitation of this circulatory RET with some events that we could say happens inside these developing nerve cells. We looked at the elicitation of VEGF by using in situ hybridization. And we looked at some of the secreted antigens of the parasite that comes from a very specialized row of cells that develops at the same time. So this worm has a very complicated life cycle, and it's, it's changing an already committed cell to do its bidding for 30 years in some cases. Okay, quite astounding. There's almost nothing else like that in nature, although there are now eight different species of this particular parasite. 
So the big question is, how does it do all of this? I mean, what are the events at a very small scale that leads to this nerve cell formation? And I spent the rest of my research career <laughs> working out the details of these cells of the organ called the stichosome of the trichinella larva. And it turns out there are five different kinds. They're all filled with granules. They're almost like zymogen granule cells. Each cell has a duct that leads to the gut tract of the worm. And during this worm's development, in that nurse cell, it secretes some of these products. They're all proteins. And look what happens. Several of them get inside these enlarged muscle cell nuclei as though they're communicating with the genome itself. How exciting can it get? That was at year 28 of my grant. And in year 29, I fully expected to be funded. And of course, I wasn't. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'll try it again. Of course, I wasn't. So I went off and did something else. But that, the, that's not the point of this story. The point of this story is that we still need to solve this problem because it's a big Rosetta Stone as to how this parasite behaves. We could apply this knowledge, if we knew it, to a situation where we're transplanting pancreatic islet cells from pigs into capillary and into the uh, tissue. But in, in doing so, they elicit capillaries, but not sinusoids. What if we could re-engineer those pig cells to make the parasite inducer of VEGF species that makes a sinusoid? The insulin would then be able to get in very quickly. There are other diseases which nematode parasites are prominent. One of them is a potential cure for Crohn's. So if you got that answer wrong, that's the correct answer. Allergies of various kinds, anticoagulants, they're a pharmacopoeia of nature that we have yet to take advantage of. You want to know more? Check this out. So the moral of my story is very simple. The more one looks, the more one finds. Thank you.